I met Jim, my husband, the ENT surgeon, uh, in Nairobi. Jim was a Peace Corps doctor. I was living in Kenya. My father was in the Royal Air Force, the British Air Force. I went to Kenya um, at 17. I met Jim at 22, or at 20, and got married at 22. He was 10 years older than me. Uh, I had never been to America. Uh, he had never been to England. Um, I assumed, like I think all of naive uh, young women, that you just meet somebody and the hormones go off and you like each other and you think, oh, this would be wonderful. And you progress along the normal stages of a courtship and then you marry and you think everything's just gonna be great and hunky-dory. Well, it turned into a disaster for many reasons and I have learned a lot. I'm still married to the one man I married but it is by the grace of God and the growth that God uh, gave to both of us over the years, spiritually and in other ways of learning to understand each other. But I want to explain a little bit of my background, and that is I, uh, I, I lived overseas a lot with my parents. Uh, I, lived, I was born in Scotland, uh, ended up, I think, a year as a baby in India, back to England, then to Sri Lanka, then back to England, then to Sri Lanka again, back to England, Singapore, England, and finally, Nairobi. Now, when we lived in Singapore, my parents allowed my older sister and I a lot more freedom than any sensible parent would ever allow. And they were not believers. They, I did, was not raised in a Christian home. Anyway, I ended up dating at the age of 15, 16, this Englishman who worked for my father. He was a very respectable, nice young man. So we get uh, sent back to England near London and he uh, gets back to England and he comes and he asks my parents if he could marry me, if we could get engaged at the age of 16. And my parents said yes. And my, my poor daughter, she had more restrictions on her <laughs> because when you've, you know, you've had pretty liberal parents, you turn into a pretty restrictive mother uh, because you know what dangers you're trying to protect your child from. But uh, my parents said yes, and in England, you can legally leave school at 16. And I love school, I did well in school, but I wanted to get married. And so my parents agreed that I could uh, leave school at 16. And so I did, living near London, I, I got a job in London, I did shorthand and typing and was sort of the lowest rung tea girl in this firm that I worked for in London. And my parents got an opportunity to go to Nairobi. They figured, you know, I was 16, 16 and a half, nearly 17, and I would be okay because I was engaged to this fellow and I was gonna get married. So off they went to do their thing. Well, six months after uh, this engagement, my parents vanishing from my life and me supporting myself with very little money, um, I decided to break it off. You know, you, you grow up fast <laughs> and you start to think, I don't think that's such a good idea. So I decided not to marry him. And it was a very difficult situation for me emotionally and in many ways, uh, particularly because being so poverty stricken, I hardly earned anything. By the time I paid my share of the rent to the woman I shared in a, a flat with, uh, I hardly had anything left. And it really affected my view of money and my sense of insecurity about money. And often when we have traumatic things, not just sexual, but other traumas in our lives, you know, later on those things can pop up and we need to explore what is making me so, so, uh, so filled with emotional pain or fright or fear or whatever. So any case, um, a few months after I broke it off, I went to spend the weekend with a couple and they had been in Singapore, he had been in the Navy and she had been one of my school teachers. And they asked me to go to church with them, which I did. Coming back from church, they said to me, Poppy, when were you converted? And I said, well, I don't know. I don't even know what that means. I'd never heard that word before. Now, it might be not so familiar to you here in America, but it's the equivalent of when you were born again, when did you receive Christ, when, you know, all the phrases that we use. And they explained that to me. And that afternoon, after they explained it to me, I, I came under such deep conviction of sin. I remember, I just have it vividly in my mind, sitting there in their living room alone and 
just being so overwhelmed by almost like a gray mist of conviction. And uh, that night we went back to the Anglican church and you kneel and you stand and you kneel and you stand and they said, you know, if you want peace with God, if you want cleansing from your sin and conviction and sense of shame and guilt and all those things, uh, ask Christ to forgive you to come into your life and he will do that. Well, I did. So within six, eight hours of hearing the gospel, I received Christ. The Holy Spirit knew that I was ready and he prompted them to speak boldly to me. And I am so grateful. I have never, ever doubted that God worked in my life. And I won't take time to do, say too much more, but in any case, I ended up going to Nairobi uh, within six weeks. During that six weeks, I met people who had gone to a certain church in Nairobi, never knew them before, met them like in a restaurant somewhere uh, and got introduced to people. But God gave me my own book of Acts. People coming and saying, well, if your parents are in Nairobi, maybe you're going. And if you go, you should, you know, go to this church. This is where I got baptized. Or go, here's the name of an elder in this church. I mean, it was utterly remarkable. And I think God does that for us when we don't have a clue about the fifth Christian faith. We don't have anyone in our lives to guide us. He will bring people in some miraculous ways. So I ended up in Nairobi and uh, went, to, went to this little church and uh, it was there a few years later that I met my husband, Jim. So that's what I was doing. And I was working and supporting myself. My parents then went back to England. So we were again separated. So I've sort of been on my own pretty much since I was 16. And there's a lot of issues that go with, with that too. So we got married in, in Nairobi at Nairobi Chapel. And... Uh, we took a six-week trip across the Far East to come to America. We did that because my parents, who had never met my husband, <clears throat> and I had never met his family. We had no family whatsoever at the wedding. Um, so we went because my parents were once again back in Singapore, and then we came to the States, and I met his parents in Iowa. Jim is from a very strict, uh, very deeply devoted Christian home. I came from a non-Christian, let's go dancing, you know, have a drink, all, you know, totally different lifestyle. My parents, uh, my, we did everything to keep things happy for my mother because she was an explosive type. She was very funny, very warm, but very quickly angered. And we all knew to keep mum quiet and calm and happy. My husband comes, so it was a matriarchal home. My husband comes from a patriarchal home where everything was very role-defined. Women did this, men did that, and you don't switch roles. And on and on and on. Any case, it was difficult. So after being married about six months and realizing all the differences between us in temperament, in background, in beliefs, in how you live the Christian life, I felt I had made the worst decision of my life. I was 22 years old. And I felt, what did I do? This was crazy. Why did I marry someone I didn't know? Never being here, I came to America. We came to America. Uh, within a week of, of arriving in Portland, Oregon, Jim started his residency, surgery residency, on call every other night for a year in the hospital. I knew no one in the country, no family, no friends. The church we went to was an hour away, and everybody was as legalistic as what he had come from, and I felt no joy or freedom to, to be myself. It was a very traumatic time uh, for me. And I won't go into you know, too much more, and my book, uh, Why Can't He Be More Like Me, is sold out, but you can go to Amazon and, and get it if you're interested. But I talk about what happened and how I became a person I never wanted to be. I became a person who was very angry, very bitter, and then when I volunteered in domestic violence uh, shelter for a few years and read a lot about abuse, I discovered that I was verbally abusive. And I was horrified at what I had become like because I loved the Lord, I just didn't know how to live for Christ. And so my poor husband, it's a little like what Shanti was saying this morning, you know, men have one compartment for home and one for work, so I know that he would leave the home in the morning and never think about us because he was now in the work circle. 
and he would just think about work and surgery and all the things. And then when he walked in the door, he was then in the whole marriage family circle. And uh, so that was his escape. That was his place to you know, not have to deal with what I was dealing with all the time. So anyway, why am I telling you all this? It's because if you're single, you are most likely going to marry. And if you're married, you might find some of these issues cropping up that I want to talk about in your relationship. Most of you probably will marry. And so I feel like I, uh, almost a burden and a longing from the Lord to give some words of not necessarily caution, but wisdom to have your head screwed on when you are looking at a dating relationship, whether you're a man or a woman. And those of you who are married, to recognize some of the issues that might be in your marriage that you don't really see what is the root of, of the difficulty between us. So in the early chapters of Genesis, I'm talking because love is in the air. And when you're single, love is always in the air, I think. <laughs> but in the early chapters of Genesis, we, we're told that God created male and female. I mean, we know that. And he made us with a longing for a companion in life. Few people go through life without longing for someone to belong to, to enjoy life with, to create life with, uh, to share experiences, joys, struggles, to have sex with, to create babies, to have companionship and a home together. That seems to be hardwired into most men and women. We want that. Uh, that relationship. And marriage is a gift from God. We've got to remember that. It is a gift from God. And it is meant for our good. But we all know that it can come apart at the seams. We've seen it. We see it constantly. You might be from a home where that's what happened to your parents. It came apart at the seams. I have a friend whose mother married, I think, 10 times. Can you imagine that kind of background and her view of the permanency of marriage? So we know when it comes apart at, at the seams that it leaves great scars, and that is very difficult. So that's what nearly happened to me. After a couple of years, I was pleading with God to let me leave Jim. We just clashed over everything. I think our backgrounds, our personalities, our views of things, our perspectives, how you handle things. Uh, we just couldn't seem to find where we agreed with each other. And it was very painful because that's not what you want. So I nearly walked away from our marriage. But the Lord just got hold of me. And you know the psalm, I can't remember if it was 139 or 130 or whatever, I can never remember the exact psalm. But where he talks about, where can I go from your presence? If I, if I run to the far side of the ocean, if I do this, if I do that, you will be there. Well, I would read that in these, in these years of desperation. And I'd say, God, it's not fair. Wherever I go, if I go back to Nairobi, if I go to London, if I try to start again, you are going to be there. And you won't leave me alone. And I, I mean, I was upset about it. I mean, in recent you know, more healthy, emotionally mature years, I think, God, thank you, that when I get on this mosquito-sized plane in Indonesia once to go to a mission hospital gym, <laughs> and I'm sitting in the back, and these two, four hunks of men are in the front of this plane, and I'm looking over the jungles of Borneo with the smoke coming out, and I think, God, how did I ever get here? I don't like planes. <laughs> you know? But you were with me, so I'm grateful for that. But in those early years, it was like I felt so boxed in, which is exactly what God intended. But I came to a place of brokenness before the Lord. I, I, was, I was just yo-yoing emotionally. I was depressed. I was angry. I was in tears all the time. I was in despair. And so I came to a point where I just cried out to God, I can't do this anymore. And I had been praying, God, change Jim. Change him so he will see my point of view, so he will agree with me, so things are easier between us. And finally, I sensed the Holy Spirit saying to me, Poppy, let me change you. And you know, that was the beginning. And men and women, if there's a lot of conflict in some relationship, get on your knees and say, God, where do I need to change? Because what am I contributing to this? And so I felt broken before the Lord, and it was there that I just made a commitment. I was going to stay in the marriage, 
And being immature at that point, I said, and if I'm unhappy the rest of my life, so be it. <laughs> and not realizing that God takes broken pieces and he puts something beautiful together in time and with our cooperation. He never waves magic wands, which is what we all want. God, you do it. You make things different. You make them perfect. He says, no, you walk with me and you listen and you obey and you yield and you surrender and things will move. So marriage, what is marriage about? Well, there are five facts I think that I want to share with you today. And they are that you're not the same. Your clone does not exist, okay? You're not from the same home. These are just some basics. Your brains are wired differently, and Shanti dealt with that this morning. You have different emotional needs, and your view of money matters. These things can create so many uh, stresses and conflicts in a relationship. It's really important to, to have an understanding of them. What I want to share about with marriage is that marriage is not intended to make us woohoo happy, everything is wonderful. It is a, an environment through which God wants to perfect us into the likeness of Christ. And that often is not understood. I certainly didn't understand it. Let me give you a quote from Gary Thomas, the author of Sacred Marriage, and a book well worth reading. He com comments on the cultural belief that romantic feelings, listen to this, are the criteria for both marrying and staying married. So you hear people say, well, I just don't love him or I don't love her anymore. And that's what he's saying here. Romantic feelings are not the criteria for staying married. And he says the idea that marriage can survive on romance alone or that romantic feelings are more important than any other consideration when choosing a spouse has wrecked many a marital ship. In other words, and this is what I'm trying to say, get your head screwed on. The romantic feelings will not always be there. They can come and go. But when they go, you don't go, okay? You hold on and know that you work on issues and then your marriage will uh, again revive with, with love and romance and, and so on. So romantic feelings are wonderful. We all know that. And we probably wouldn't marry or be attracted to somebody if we didn't have some feelings towards them. But there's so many more realities that go into an emotionally healthy marriage. And these are the five I want to talk to you about. First of all, that your clone does not exist. I thought when I got married, in fact, I probably didn't think at all. I assumed, we all assume that this person we've dated, we've got to know, we've laughed with, we've, you know, in my case with Jim, uh, he took me out hunting one day on the plains of, of Africa and he had a shotgun and he shot this poor zebra standing there like a cow, you know, just waiting to be. <laughs> And he skinned it. My husband used to be a veterinarian as before he went to medical school. And he was raised on a farm. So he could do all these amazing manly things. And I just, ugh, I don't like to look at that. I don't like blood, so <laughs> I'm not medical. But he did that. We climbed Kilimanjaro with a group of other friends, Peace Corps friends of Jim's. And, you know, I, oh, I went flying. He learned to fly in the Peace Corps. I mean, he was a doctor. He was not a volunteer, so he got paid. And uh, we went up in a plane, and he forgot to adjust the mixture when we were 7,000 feet above Nairobi, uh, when he took off, and we almost stalled and crashed. So I've had my share of all these things. So you assume you're marrying someone who's, you share all this in common, and it's so wonderful. And then you marry, and life intrudes. You have to go to work. You're exhausted after 12 hours in the hospital. You have to come home and study for boards. You have to be ready for the next day's surgery or patient or, or what, test or whatever it is. And you know we think that we're marrying our clone, somebody just like us. We have so much in common. But what you will find is, no, you don't. You have some things in common and some things that you don't have in common. And when you're in love, you, make, you can make this mistake, which is setting you up for disillusionment and distress, which is we are so alike, we have so much in common, and we're going to enjoy this so much. But you forget 
there's dishes to be done, there's bills to be paid, there's food to be bought and cooked, and life is not one date after the other. And this person is not your clone and doesn't necessarily share what you want to do. And yesterday in the marriage seminar, I just talked very briefly. Um, when I married, I assumed that Jim and I would sit up at night and look into each other's eyes and uh, talk about deep things and drink coffee and, you know, just uh, discuss, I mean, whatever, philosophy, the meaning of life, the kind of stuff I find interesting. Well, it didn't take very long for me to discover that Jim didn't like staying up late at night because he had to get up at 5.30 for surgery and rounds uh, every morning, nor did he drink coffee. He had no interest in discussing philosophical stuff. That's just not his thing. And that, you know, nor did he want to sit there. He wanted to go to sleep. So, <laughs> I mean, all these romantic things. So you just have to be prepared that, yes, you might have things in common, but it doesn't mean when you marry it's all going to work out nice and easy. Okay, second thing reality. You're not from the same home, and I've alluded to that already. Even if you were born on the same street in the same town, you are not alike. You have not come from the same home, because your parents might have been hardworking, very ethical, uh, paid their bills on time, and life went well. They knew how to discipline the kids. They didn't explode in anger at each other. But you might have been raised two houses down in the same place, but your parents were constantly raging at each other. They were slamming doors. They were swearing at each other. One was drinking, you know, until they were drunk. You cannot, you've got to understand, we bring into the marriage our history, how we've been shaped by our upbringing. And the reason I'm saying all this is I want you to talk about these things with somebody you're dating or with the person you're married to because it will help you. There will be so many oh, that's why you do this. That's why you do that. Jim and I, it's almost a joke between us now, once we learn these things, which took a long time. But to say, oh, did your mother used to do it like that? Oh, I get it. Is that how your father looked at things? And not in an angry, put-down way, but more in accumulating information that makes you see, oh, that's where it's coming from, that attitude, that viewpoint, that perspective. But you're not from the same home, so don't assume that your experiences and ideas about marriage or family life, having kids, raising kids, working, things like that, uh, are identical because they're not. And our expectations are based on, on these assumptions. And then when they don't materialize, there's um, areas that, that create conflict between you. Okay, I won't take long on the brains. Your brains are wired differently. You know more about this than I do, not being medical. But as Shanti said, you know, the male brain, the female brain parts of it uh, are, are different. We have different chemicals coursing through us. Uh, men have, uh, you know, a lot more testosterone. Uh, women have estrogen. Testosterone, according to my research and my observation of men, uh, causes a man to want to be independent to have a sense of freedom, not being corralled like his wife or girlfriend is like his mother telling him what to do and, you know, you should look like that and you should dress like that and you shouldn't say that and mind your manners and, you know, just like you're a substitute mother. Men, it's almost like they want to throw it off and say, you know, we need to back off and let them be men. But then there's the personality type. I think this is really important. I've found that in my own marriage and I've seen it in others. So often, people are attracted to the opposite. I'm not sure why, because it's not always good. I think some people can make it work, but for others, it can be very frustrating. And so you're attracted to somebody, and, you know, I, and often when you marry, you don't really know your own personality. You haven't grown and matured enough to recognize who you really are and how that works with somebody else's personality. But I would encourage you to look into that to I, probably you've all done Myers-Briggs or all the other uh, professional ones. But just understanding that when you have different personalities, you are going to handle things differently. And I talk about that in, in my book because that has been a big thing between Jim and I. Jim is more phlegmatic. He's very low key. He does not want to be pushed into stuff. A phlegmatic becomes stubborn. Somebody who is more, uh, 
in the, the basic term, the sanguine, the uh, melancholy, and so on, and the cleric, who's the more driver type. You know, you, you can clash over how you're even going to get ready to go to church. One wants to just be ready half an hour earlier. The other wants to slide in there 10 minutes after it began. And it just there are so many issues that crop up. And that can create irritation unless you start to click into, OK, maybe that's how he did it in his upbringing. Maybe that's his personality. Maybe that's how he processes information. But I don't have time to, to go into any more detail than that. But even processing information, I give the story in, in my book of um, we were driving along one day, and I said to Jim, why don't we go to, Di this is when our kids were smaller, why don't we go to Disneyland this year in July? Nothing. Silence. So we go a little further, and I say, what do you think about going to Disneyland in July? Silence. Driving along. And then I say, getting more and more irritated, because that's my personality, is come on, come on, come on, let's get this done. And so I finally get really irritated. I say, why aren't you talking to me? What is the problem? Now, you sweet Christian girls will probably never speak to your spouse or boyfriend that way, but whatever. I, I was in, still am in the learning growth process. <laughs> so in this injured voice, he glances at me while he's driving. He says, I'm still thinking about your first question. I'm not ignoring you. And, you know, I've had to learn over and over that, it, you know, my immediate rush to judgment is often totally wrong because his personality is just to slowly process. And mine is, come on, come on, come on, let's make a decision, then we'll work out the details. He's thinking, can I take time off? Uh, can somebody cover for me? Uh, will that work? Could we drive in this old car that we have? Could we afford to fly? So he's going through all this before he says yes or no. And I'm saying, say yes or say no. Don't worry about it. We'll talk about details later. So there's a lot of ways that um, you can have conflict, differences, difficulties because of different personality types. OK, you have different emotional needs. Now, just obviously, we're human beings. We all want love. We want acceptance. We want uh, to have affection. We want respect. Men and women both want to be respected, particularly in this day and age where women see themselves and are equal to men. And you want respect. You don't want to be put down because you're a woman. That has gone out with the dark ages, I hope. But nevertheless, there are different emotional needs, and it's important for women and men to realize that, that we're different in what we need to make us feel uh, emotionally healthy. Women generally want more from men in terms of conversation. Some men are the chatter ones. I know some couples where she's the quiet one, he's the one who talks a lot. But often, the woman is the one who's talking and craves conversation and, and so on, and, and he's more quiet. Then there's companionship. Women marry to have somebody to do things with, you know, and meaning their husband. And I think a lot of guys think being married is nice, but they still want to go out with their buddies and go to ball games and watch football and whatever it is. But women are looking usually for a companion, i.e. their husband to be with them. And they want emotional closeness, which is often physical closeness without it being sex. Men generally want freedom. They want freedom to take risks, to do things by themselves with other guys, and not be pressured or controlled by the woman in their life. That doesn't go over well. So what I would say to this is learn to notice your different emotional needs and accept them. So what I'm giving you are just little snippets of issues that you might want to explore further, uh, both as a man and a woman. OK, here's a biggie. This is one of the highest reasons for divorce, is fighting over money. And this, again, I said earlier, for me, I never realized for many years how my early teen years living on my own, supporting myself, being traumatized by having no money, barely enough to eat. Um, I didn't realize what that had done to me until more, probably five, 10 years ago. But money means different things to different people. And let me just run through these. Well, you see it there. I, I want you to ask yourself, what does money mean to you? Maybe you've not thought about it. 
But does it mean fun? It means, oh, great. You know, I'm getting, I'm getting a little increase this year. I'm moving up from one year to two years, whatever, your residency, if you get a, a, you know, an increase in pay. Now I can go and do this, or we can go and do this. So money equals fun. <laughs> then the other one is money equals success. So when all of you become high paying, high, highly paid doctors, or you choose to go on the mission field, uh, but if you have, have money, like many doctors do, what do you do with it? Do you show it off? Do you go up in the, the house that you have? So like the joke last night, you start out in this little small tumble down house and then you end up with half a million or a million dollar house, depending what part of the country you live in. And, and do you stay with your little old Toyota or do you move up to um, some, uh, the, a European car or you move up to, you know, ultimately Mercedes or, or even more glamorous. You know, what, what does money mean to you? Does it mean success? How about your partner if you're married? Because a lot of the fights over money can be because you see it very differently. Then the third one is money equals security. And for my husband, with his being raised on a farm with frugal parents, they weren't poor, but they didn't spend anything. And from the Midwest, where the, the uh, ethos is, if it's, if it's serviceable, it's good enough. And so, <laughs> so, so, you know, you get money and you put it away for a rainy day. And I, in the chapter I write on this in, the, in my book, I call it, um, she sees, uh, let's see, She's, she says bargain, he, he's, he thinks bankruptcy. So women look at things perhaps depending. The husband can be the spender. And so if you're in a dating mode, watch that. Look at that. Discuss it. What is, and find out for yourself. Ask yourself, what does the money mean to me? Does it mean I've made it and I need to, for my own self-esteem and self-worth and all those good things, I need to be dressing that way. I need to be having that kind of car, live in that kind of condo. So if you date someone, talk about money because it's a biggie. And then the, the fourth uh, way that we can view money is that it, is, um, it, it signifies power and control. And it's treading on some dangerous ground here because control with money is a form of abuse. I do a, a, I speak on, on, on abuse, different kinds of abuse, and financial abuse is one of them, where the person who earns the most money, in the case I'm thinking of, was the husband. He gave his wife $10 a month, and she accepted it, even though she was a qualified teacher and working part-time. But it was a control thing for him. It was a dominant thing. And and it can be that way. So you can be having two people, and those of you, men and women, you are going to be wage earners, you're gonna be salary earners. You could earn a lot of money, depending on, on how your life moves, but think about how you're gonna handle the money issue. Is it gonna be two separate pots with a third one for the bills? Uh, is one of you gonna be more dominant and say no? I'm going to say where the money goes. I earn the most. Maybe you're at home, a wife or even a husband, at home taking care of the children. So is the one who brings in the most money the one who calls the shots? That can create a lot of resentment and difficulty with the one who is being controlled by and dominated by the one who brings in the money. So money is a huge trigger for fights, arguments, and divorce. I, I'm just trying to give you some things I wish I knew uh, in early years and that I think is important information. So in my last slide, I just want to, to say this, that I, my goal in sharing this is to prepare you for a healthy, emotionally healthy marriage and dating relationship. So I'm asking you to take time to look at who you are, get to know yourself, your strengths, your personality, where you get irritable, what makes you irritable, what ticks you off in just general and then think of it in a marriage situation. Is it you're marrying somebody and they're never on time? I mean, look for those issues that really bug you and if you're not married yet, start looking for them, watching for them, discussing them. 
and don't hide your head in the sand about it. Um, and what are your expectations of a wife or a husband? I should have put that there. Then look back and ask yourself, how is my home life, how my parents acted, their values, their behavior, the dysfunction or the healthy behavior in our home, how has that shaped me and my view of what a good marriage should be and my idea of roles of men and women? Review the facts that I just gave you and choose some. And I really encourage you to, if you're dating, to go on a date, and I hope with that handout you've got a few things to say, let's talk about this. Let's get to know each other on a deeper level than, oh, do you like chow mein or do you like fried rice? I mean, you know, life is more important than that, and yet a dating relationship can remain on that kind of level, and it needs to go deeper to hopefully help you make a good, wise choice. So whether single or married, go on a date and say, let's get to know more about each other. Let's get to know each other better because God wants to bless you with a good marriage, but he's also given you a head to help you think before you make those choices. Let me add one last thing. If you're thinking of going on the mission field and you followed the programs the last few days, you can see how important it is that you choose wisely because I'm sure there's many a, a husband or wife who longed to be on the mission field, found themselves married to somebody who had no interest. So pray about those things if you haven't made those choices yet. And be sure you're choosing wisely the one that God wants to bless you with and make you a blessing to them. And just to reassure you, I would say the last years, 5, 10, 15 years of my marriage to my husband, once we got to understand each other and understand ourselves, um, it has been so remarkably different. So there is hope. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>